communication directly with your inverter, two programmable relays, built-in current limiting and of course an active balancer, and some nifty state of charge and float mode settings, and it can connect to your computer. This is the new JK Inverter BMS. So today we'll have a close look at all the bits and pieces that you get in the box. We'll talk about all of the specs and features, and we're also gonna talk about some of the new settings specific to this device. So I ended up buying this BMS with my own money and it cost 3,000 Rand, about 163 US dollars and 153 Rand for shipping. And I bought it from lithiumcells.co.za and that is a local business here in South Africa. Now this is the second time that I've bought something from them. Previously, about a year ago, I bought two of the other style JK BMSs. Those have been installed and working perfectly ever since. So thumbs up for that, guys. Um, and I ordered this from the online store, lithiumcells.co.za. I ordered it late on Friday afternoon and it arrived here on my doorstep by Wednesday morning. So what do we get in the box? So the first thing I see is the on off button. Next up are the three cables that link the BMS to the interface board or the comms board if you will and a blue ethernet cable. We'll look at these a little bit more closely a little later on in the video. The second packet contains the balance leads and the temperature probes. We'll also look at these more closely later on in the video. Loose in the box is a small green terminal connector block and in the first bubble wrap packet is an interface board or that communications board and this is where all of the in-out communications plug into. And lastly, it's the BMS itself. And first impressions, this looks and feels like a solid piece of kit. By the way, I'll leave links in the description in case you guys wanna purchase any of this stuff and if you are in South Africa, you might wanna consider supporting a South African business like Lithium Cells. Um, and also if there's any other information that I've forgotten to mention, I'll leave that in the description. So this model specifically is the JK-PB1A 16S-15P and it can connect from 8 to 16 lithium ion phosphate cells and can handle a continuous load of 150 amps and I believe up to 300 amps for two seconds. It's also got a one amp active balancer built in. Now you do get other models, you get a 100 amp version of this and you also get a 200 amp version of this. This is just the one that's in the middle of the range. It's also got all of the, the, the protective features, if you will, built in like over and under voltage protection, your over and under uh, current charge and discharge protection, over and under temperature protection, and a built-in coulomb counter for measuring energy usage and calculating state of charge. It also has connectors for four lots of balance leads, the switch or LCD screen, heating pads if you live in a colder environment, and three connectors for wiring to the interface board. Included in the package are four lots of balance leads measuring in at 900 millimeters long or about 35 inches, and they are 22 American wire gauge, which is about 0.33 millimeters squared. So connecting up to large cells in larger battery packs should be pretty easy. The temperature probes are also 900 millimeters long. The three interface cables are 300 millimeters long, which is about 11.8 inches, and the total length of the B plus wire to power the BMS is 500 millimeters long. It's about 19.7 inches. And it is 16 American wire gauge, which is about 1.5 millimeters squared. The switch wire is 500 millimeters long, again 19.7 inches. And the ethernet cable is a CAT5E cable and it is 490 millimeters long. Now I really like the fact that there are two programmable relays on these inverter BMSs. Each of these relays has got dry contacts which connect to the interface board and each can handle a switching load of 90 watts or a maximum switching current of 3 amps or a maximum switching voltage of 250 volts AC. It also has really solid terminal blocks for both the battery and the load connection points. Each of these battery and load connection terminals use two six millimeter machine screws to fasten your lug onto the terminal block. And I think part of the reason why this BMS feels so solid is because it's got two millimeter thick aluminum heatsink plates on both sides of the circuit board. So if you look closely inside between the two plates, you'll see the charge and the discharge MOSFETs, and these press up against the plates with a bit of thermal tape. Now I'm kind of thinking that thermal paste might have been better to use, you know, for better heat transfer. But then again, who knows? I'm sure these guys have done their proper research. And that's just my diagnosis. Either way, my thoughts when it comes to something like this is to overspec your requirement. So I don't plan to be pulling more than 50 
50 to 75 amps of continuous load. So this 150 amp BMS should be well within its thermal limits. But of course, if you guys plan to be pulling 100 or even 150 amps, then maybe you want to go for the 200 amp version. Looking at the interface board, it's got some dip switches, some connectors, a few LEDs and a push button. And starting along the top row, the blue push button is a reset button. The four dip switches are to set the RS-485 communication address of the battery. The green connector connects to the dry contacts of those two programmable relays I mentioned earlier. The first set of RJ45 ports is for the RS-485 and CAN communication with your inverter. The middle RJ11 port is for the RS-232 communication and the last set of RJ45 ports is for communication between battery packs. Onto the row of status LEDs, the first green LED indicates if the BMS is on or off and the second green LED indicates if the BMS is running. The third red LED flashes and it indicates when there is a fault or an alarm state and you can go and check exactly what this is in the JK BMS app. And the next row of six green LEDs indicates the battery state of charge. Some other things to note about mounting the BMS is that it's got eight three millimeter holes around the outside of the board. And it is 100 millimeters wide by 300 millimeters long. So just keep that in mind if you are building your own DIY enclosure, make sure you make it big enough so this entire unit fits in. When it comes to the interface board, the interface board has also got four three millimeter holes, one at each corner and it is 45 millimeters wide by 160 millimeters long. So when it comes to screens, this BMS is compatible with a two and a half inch display screen that works with the other style of JK BMS. And that's our previously reviewed. If you are interested in the video, I'll leave a link in the description. And it is also compatible with the larger 4.3 inch LCD touchscreen. So the smaller screen like this has a gray on off button on the side and long pressing it either turns on or off the BMS. Once the BMS is up and running though, a quick press of the button wakes up the screen or it puts it to sleep again. On this, the smaller screen, it shows you your charge or discharge rate, remaining battery percentage and a bar level indicator. It's basically your state of charge and the total battery pack voltage. So of course, this is very limited information that the small two and a half inch screen shows you. If you want a, a screen that shows you more information, you're going to have to purchase the 4.3 inch LCD touchscreen. Unfortunately, I don't have one to show you guys. So maybe in a future video, I'll do that. Or if you wanna see uh, the full set of information and be able to change all of the settings, you can access those uh, on your smartphone. You connect directly to the BMS using the JK BMS app, and you can do everything from there. Now, this is something that you guys can help with. I'm not 100% sure about this, and please, if you know any more, let us know in the comments. But I think if you're using the 4.3 inch LCD touch screen, it needs to use two connectors. It needs to use the LCD interface and the RS-485 interface. So if that is the case, this means that the RS-485 port can't be used for anything else at the same time. So if you guys are able to help, like I said, let us know in the comments. So to change settings on these BMSs, there's gonna be two options available. One using the PC software, but the more popular version is going to be using the um, JK BMS app on your smartphone. This is the same app as the previous versions of the BMS used, except it allows you to change a couple more settings that are specific to these inverter BMSs. So a quick overview, it has three basic screens. It's got the status, settings, and control screen. And the status screen shows you total battery voltage, capacity, individual cell voltages, balance current, cell voltage differences, cell count, temperatures, cell wire resistance, and a couple of other odds and ends. The setting screen is where you're gonna set up your BMS to either the default settings or, which is probably a better thing to do, uh, you can go ahead and customize each of these settings to your specific requirements. And the control screen is where you can turn on or off your charge and your discharge uh, settings, your balance settings, it's got an emergency setting. You can turn on or off your float mode settings and a couple of little odds and ends. Now, of course, this is not a complete walkthrough of each and every setting and bit of information that's available on the app. It's just a bit of an overview so that you guys can get more of an idea of what it's about. Maybe we'll look at that in a future video, but there's also Andy from the Off Grid Garage. He's done a phenomenal job of testing this BMS 
and he walks through all of the settings uh, and features available. He does a really good job of that. So I'll also put a link in the, in the description if you wanna go check out those videos. Now, because this is an inverter BMS and it's got CAN and RS5 uh, communication built into it, so it can communicate with your inverter, there's a couple of additional settings compared to the other style of BMS. And there's a couple of them that are gonna be of interest. So let's have a look at those. So first up is the requested charge voltage. Now this is the voltage that the BMS is gonna request from your inverter to charge your cells. Now, of course, this is a per cell voltage, so multiply that by 16 to get your full pack voltage charge limit. Um, so this is used in conjunction with the RCV time or your requested charge voltage time. Now, once the timer runs out, it tells the inverter to lower the voltage to the requested float voltage or your RFV. So it's basically an absorption timer. So the next setting of interest is the requested float voltage or RFV. Now, the way I understand it is once the battery has been bulk charged and it's, the cells are fully absorbed, there's no need to keep the battery or the cells at this really high voltage uh, because if we stop charging, they will naturally settle down to a sl slightly lower voltage. And this is gonna be your requested float voltage setting. So when does it ever change over to the bulk charge voltage again? And that is where this next setting comes in. This is the RFV time or your requested float voltage time, which means that the BMS is gonna request from your inverter to stay at this float voltage for whatever amount of time that you set here. After this time, then the battery will rebulk itself again or it'll request from the inverter to charge back up to the requested charge voltage. I hope that makes sense and I'm explaining it correctly. Then we've got our SOC 100% voltage, which is basically a reset voltage for the state of charge. So when one of the cells reaches the set voltage, the state of charge will reset back to 100% and the capacity will also be reset. And in turn, of course, the inverter will also show a 100% state of charge. So as an example, if you consider 3.4 volts per cell to be a 100% state of charge, then, then you set that setting here. And when one of the cells reaches 3.4 volts, then the BMS is gonna consider that a 100% state of charge and it'll reset. Similarly, on the other end of the scale, we've got SOC 0% voltage, uh, which is basically your 0% state of charge. And this is where the BMS and the inverter will show 0% state of charge when the battery, or I should say the cell, one of the cells reaches this voltage. So again, as an example, if you consider your battery completely flat or 0% state of charge at 2.6 volts per cell, instead of going all the way down to 2.5 volts per cell, you set 2.6 volts uh, in this setting and when it gets, when one of the cells gets to 2.6 volts, then the BMS will consider this 0% state of charge and that's what it's gonna report back to your inverter. Now, I really like these two settings because I would rather operate not down to the lower limit of each cell and not right up to the top limit of each cell. I wanna kind of operate in the safe zone in between. And because the BMS is communicating with your inverter, the next setting is your continued charge current, which basically tells the inverter the maximum allowed current to charge the battery. And conversely, on the other side of the scale, uh, there's the continued discharge current, which basically tells the inverter the maximum allowed current to discharge from the battery. And if you remember earlier, I mentioned these two programmable relays. Well, in the app, there are trigger and release settings for both of these dry contacts. And there's a number of different trigger options that you can choose from. And last but not least, another really nice feature that this BMS has that the other style of JK BMS don't have is your charge current limiting function. So what this means is that basically, if your maximum charge current is exceeded or the continued charge current limit that you set in the settings, instead of turning off the charge MOSFETs, this BMS realizes what's happening and it doesn't turn them off, it just limits the charge current to 10 amps. So remember the continued charge current limit is set to 20 amps and now I'm going to ramp up the charge current to 25 amps. So as soon as the BMS registers more than 20 amps of incoming charge and after five seconds, because that's the time delay that we have set, the PCL module is activated and we can see that the charge is being limited to 10 amps. You'll also notice the 15 second recovery timer has been activated.
And when the timer runs out, the limiter remains active because the charge current still exceeds 20 amps. If the charge current is reduced to 15 amps, which is of course below the 20 amp limit that we have set, the PCL module or the charge limiter still remains active. Now why doesn't it reset and allow the full charge current after the overcurrent protection recovery timer runs out? I'm not exactly sure, but I'm guessing this is because the BMS doesn't know how much current in excess of 10 amps is coming in, or how much current it's having to bleed off. So uh, it could still be a massive amount of current coming in, but in this case, we know it's only 15 amps of charge now coming in, but the BMS doesn't know this, so it still seems to limit the charge to 10 amps. It doesn't seem to be allowing the full charge after the recovery timer has run out and checking how much charge is coming in once again, and then either deciding to limit the current once again, or if it's within the limits that we've set in the BMS, allowing the full current to flow. So it seems that only once the incoming charge limit has been reduced to 5 amps, and of course the BMS registers there is only 5 amps incoming, which is less than both the 10 amp limiting current and the 20 amp continued charge limit that we have set, you'll notice that it takes about a 1 minute and 20 seconds before the charge limit module is eventually deactivated. Also, why did it take about a minute and 20 seconds for the charge limiter to be deactivated when we have the recovery time set as 15 seconds in the BMS? Now this could be due to the inverter's charger taking time to either ramp up or ramp down its charge and for everything to stabilize. And of course the BMS is waiting for the stable current before it releases any charge limits. Or it could be something internally in the BMS that needs to be corrected via firmware update. So this is the basic idea of how the charge limiting function works, but maybe some further more scientific testing is needed. Also, maybe you guys have done some of your own testing and you know a little bit more, and if you do, please let us know in the comments. So overall, is it worth spending your hard-earned money on an inverted BMS like this? Especially if you've already got one of the older style or the other style JK BMSs. Well, I would say if you need your BMS to, to communicate with your inverter, or if you want to make use of these two programmable relays, then yeah, go for it, pick up one of these. Um, it's quite convenient to have all of your communications and everything built into this BMS compared to say the other style of JK BMS where you would need to have little addition or add-on boards to communicate uh, with your inverter. Another question is how well is it built and how long is it going to last? Well, of course, I've only had this for a couple of days, but if the older style or the other style JK BMS is anything to go by, those have been running flawlessly for, I think, more than a year now. So I'm really happy about that. And if you have a close look at how the PC boards are made and how cleanly they are printed and soldered, it looks like a pretty good product. <laughs> now keep this in mind, I've torn down a couple of power tools before from major power brands, uh, major power tool brands, and some of their boards don't look as good as this. So if that's anything to go by, I'm pretty happy with the way this thing's built so far, but of course only time will tell. You can also update the firmware on these. There have been a number of bugs when they were first released and JK has been addressing these bugs and fixing them in firmware updates. So that is also really nice about these inverted BMSs. So I hope you guys found the video useful. If you did, please give it a thumbs up, leave us a comment, let us know what you think. Thank you very much for watching and you'll see me in the next one. Cheers.